And as you can see, the title is way too long, so that's why I didn't write it on the board. So um, first of all, this is all joint work with uh, Urs Fuchs and Will Barry. OK, so I want to tell you a little bit about positive loops and recent results we obtained. So let's just set the stage. So we're talking here about contact manifolds. Uh, so I assume them always to be co-oriented for this notion of positivity. It doesn't make sense otherwise. So it's a um, co-oriented contact manifold and a contact isotopy always will denote by phi and it's sort of it's a path phi t t runs in interval 0 1 so it's just a smooth path of contact morphisms nothing else um, and I always base them at the identity the contact isotopy uh, has a contact Hamiltonian Uh, which is the function? Which it's a function on the interval zero one um, cross sigma two r, and it's defined in in the usual way, namely uh -huh. defined in the usual way, namely h sub t. So I write h sub t for okay. Maybe I just write this h sub t of x is h of t and x, the usual abbreviation. And then h t of x, that I have to define a function, and I do that at the point phi t. Is, I mean, it's the usual flow thing, right? You take alpha applied to d by dt on phi t. d by dt phi t is the, Hamiltonian, uh, is, is the vector field generating the isotopy, um, and you just evaluate alpha on this. This gives you a function. And as usual with flows, you should take this at phi t. OK, that's the contact Hamiltonian. And this is a 1-1 one -one relation. Meaning the contact Hamiltonian is obviously uniquely determined. I wrote here an equation. But you can go the other way around. Given any such function h, t, uh, h any function, no, no further constraints, you can construct a contact isotopy whose contact Hamiltonian is the given function. That's what I mean by 1-1 one -one relation. So the space of contact isotopies is the same as the space of, of these functions uh, after choice of a contact form, right? Contact form enters here. OK, so then you can use this notion to make the following definition. And this is Elia Sperg Poltorowicz, 2000. The definition is phi this contact isotopy is defined to be positive if ht of x is greater than 0 for all t and x, where, of course, h is the corresponding contact Hamiltonian. OK, so since you can, it's the same as, as, as functions. You just say the isotopy is positive if the function is positive. OK, and if you can do positive, then you can do negative, and so on. So similarly, you say, uh, so we have, we say greater or equal than 0, less than 0, and less or equal than 0. OK, so we have positive, negative, non-positive, non-negative. OK, so that's, that's a nice definition. Important remark to make here is this does not depend on the contact form, as long as I fix the co-orientation. Right? Because I mean, th th this is it's a trivial remark, but it's a remark nonetheless. Uh, the contact Hamiltonian depends very much on alpha. But if you change the contact form, keeping the co-orientation, you just change the contact form, contact Hamiltonian by some positive function. So notion of positivity, no negativity, la 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 la, it's all preserved. So this is really a property of the contact isotopy, not of something relating the contact form. OK, good. Uh, so once you have this definition, you can go further. And that's all Elias Beck poltorowicz Here, what I'm, what I'm talking about here is you can say uh, you have two interesting groups. You have the group quant 0 of sigma. This is just the 
identity component of the group of, of contactomorphisms. Uh, so on this space, you can say an element psi, so this is now a single contactomorphism, I define to be greater or equal than the identity by definition means there exists a, a non-negative isotopy phi such that it ends at this given psi. So all endpoints, in other words, all endpoints of non-negative isotopies I declare as being greater or equal than the identity. And th that's, that's one, one definition you can make. And then the other group is universal cover where you make a, diff uh, a similar definition so on con zero tilde sigma this is again this is just this is the universal cover of con zero tilde uh, of con zero you make a similar definition and to make this precise uh, I want to think of, of this very very concretely. I mean, just mean this is all path of contact to morphisms up to homotopies with fixed endpoints, right? The, the usual way you define a universal cover. So elements in here are path starting at the identity, ending somewhere, up to the equivalence relation given by homotopy with fixed endpoints. Okay? So on con, we, we define a class is greater or equal than identity, where this is strictly speaking the class of the identity. Right? This is maybe I write it. If there exists a non-negative representative, representative. Again, turning it around, all classes uh, which come from non-negative isotopies are defined to be greater or equal than the identity. Okay. OK, so why is, that, why is that interesting? Two remarks, two properties. First is this thing is, ah, sorry, uh, next, uh, I forgot to show something here. You sh this is now, I just declared something greater than the identity. I want to, to extend this relation to, uh, to general things. So let me just do it here. Uh, where's the definition? Here. And I just say extend by. Psi 1 is greater or equal than Psi 2, I define by Psi 1, Psi 2 inverse is greater than the identity. OK, there's a choice which one I want to put on the left-hand side, but well, that's what you put. Yeah. So then you, th that's the usual thing you would do on, on groups. And th you do the same on con, con 0 tilde. OK? So then if I do it like this, this thingy is by construction right invariant, right? If you, if you compose here with, with yet another, if you morph them, they just cancel out in this composition. But this is actually bi invariant. <laughs> and the same here. Can you be positive and negative at the same time? Yeah, that comes now. Unfortunately, yes. Um, <laughs> so the, go the good, the good um, thing about this is it's bi invariant. But the bad thing is it's not always a partial order. This is basically what you're asking, right? So uh, can you have, so it's not, but it's not always. Uh, partial order. Okay, not. Okay, let's discuss this for a minute. Why why can this why can this happen? So assume I have a I have a path which is non negative not uh, identically the identity, so I don't sit on the identity, right? If sitting on the identity has the contact Hamiltonian zero, that's non-negative. Say it's somewhere positive, and the identity. So it's actually a loop. It's actually a loop. It's non-negative, but not the identity. And then you would conclude from this, the identity should be strictly larger than the identity. Because this is phi 1, this is phi 0. 
So right, non-negative tells you identity is greater or equal, or phi 1 is greater or equal than phi 0. But since it's not the identity, you would really say this is also a strict inequality. OK, so this is, this is a problem. And this leads to so the obstruction to this being a partial order on con 0 of sigma is given by, and now I'm doing a little thing which is not quite obvious. I mentioned, I explained in a second, positive loops. I will always say positive loops, but of, of contact homomorphisms. So this is not, ex not precisely what I explained. I just explained obstructions given by non-negative loops, which are not identically the identity. This is a little lemma here. Well, it's not so little, actually, but it's a lemma <laughs> in, in the paper by Elias berg uh, uh, let, me, let me not write it out. The lemma just tells you once you have a loop like, like that one over there, a non-negative loop, which is not sitting all the time on the identity, which is positive somewhere, then you can homotop the loop around and make it positive everywhere. Good, little lemma hidden there. And then it's the only obstruction. So if you don't have positive loops, this thing is a partial order. Once you have a positive loop, it's not. So now we discuss this only for the group cont itself on cont tilde it's slightly different so on cont zero sigma tilde the obstruction is existence not every positive loop gives you a, a, a problem there because it might define a non-trivial element in the universal cover. So the question is, is the loop contractible or not? Existence of contractible positive loops. And just because uh, this is shortcoming of, 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 uh, of our language, contractible refers to a loop. It doesn't have to be contractible through positive loops. It's just can, if you can contract the loop, it's fine. Well, it's, oh, it's a problem. Depends on your point of view here. Positive positivity is only for the for the given loop we start with, right? Not you don't have to contract it through positive loops. Okay. Okay. So these are the obstructions. So uh, that's one way why wh one reason why you might worry about or might be interested in positive loops or contractible positive loops. I want to give you one more motivation without explaining it, but I at least I want to mention it. Uh, and this is this contact squeezing. This is something which came six years later by Elias Berg, Kim, and Poltorovic. So E, Kim, and P. So Elias Berg, Kim, Poltorovic in 06. So if sigma is the boundary of W, and W is a Liouville domain, so W is compact, so compact exact symplectic um, and the boundary of W is sigma and psi is given by the kernel of the one form restricted to sigma. Okay, and the th example you, th you should think of the sphere is the boundary of the ball. Sigma is the sphere, ball is, is W. So th these things are called Liouville domains, right? Not exactly precise, I should say, the Liouville vector field points outwards along the boundary, but OK. So if this is the case, then with the follow you, ca uh, you can do the following interesting thing with a positive loop. If, if phi, phi t is a positive loop, if phi is a positive loop on sigma, then there exists what they call contact squeezing on the manifold, on the contact manifold, 
you con of, of sort of <laughs> two dimensions higher. So you take w, you cross this with s1. So uh, this is even, so it's in total odd dimensional. And the contact form you give it is, um, here we have lambda. And on s1, you take the, the, the one form you can take. So, so we can use this positive loop on what, what's called the ideal contact boundary of W to do some uh, cool stuff, let's say, on uh, I mean this contact squeezing on these, on these manifolds. That's another reason why, why this is an in interesting notion. And I, yeah, I don't want to say more, more about this. OK. OK. If I have to say it, OK. If I have to say it. And I say it in a very specific example. And in general, it's a local version of that. So let's take R2n cross S1. So w is now R2n, which is the same actually as my example. You can think of, yeah, OK. So then you look at, you can find, can define the ball of radius little r. And you cross it with S1, or let's call it R1. And then you can actually map this into, actually, better notation, capital R into little r cross S1 for certain r larger than r. So it's sort of the opposite of contact of, of, of Gromov's non-squeezing. Yeah? Gromov non-squeezing on some black D manifold would tell you you never get oh, that actually in, if, if formulated with balls is actually trivial by this volume, right? But but on the contact world there is no volume preser preserved, so you can sort of squeeze large balls cross as one into small balls cross as one if you have this positive loop, contractible or non. Da, da, da. Of that, yeah. Um, of uh, yeah. Well, we, yeah, we, we did it with Rabinowitz flow homology. Yeah. Um, actually, yeah. Also with with Urs Fuchs and Will Mary. Okay. Yeah, that's that's next on the menu. In fact. Well, I don't know what to say. I, I would say basically 0% of, of all contact manifolds have positive loops. But 100% of the interesting ones do somehow. Well, uh, where, where the, yeah. And I define uh, interesting. <laughs> OK, examples. Where, where do we find examples? So you find many examples actually by rep flows. So, that's, so uh, first of all, the rep flow is positive. Yeah, because contact Hamiltonian is 1, the constant function 1. Yep. Remember, contact Hamiltonian, you have to compute the, the, the vector field generating the isotopy. That's the rep vector field. Plug it in the contact form. You get a function. In this case, it's 1. In fact, you can even take any reparameterization of the rep flow, then you get some function here which is still positive unless you go back and forth during the flow. OK, but okay, let's keep this. So rep flows are positive. So now the easiest example, I guess, is S1. It's a contact manifold, and its rep flow is a loop. In fact, let's give it a name. Let's call it theta t. I'm always going, the, uh, going to call the rate flow theta t is a loop, positive loop. There you have one. Clearly not contractible, because you go around, there's one. OK, good. You immediately generalize this to sigma being r to n cross s1 with the example I just, with, with the contact form I just gave. You take, you take uh, well, what do you take? Um, some xi dyi minus yi dxi plus d tau. I say take or take any primitive of the symplectic form on R2 and I don't care. Um, and at this d tau, then the rep flow 
Yeah, so x now stands for x1 up to xn and so on, is just given by yeah, so a vector field is d d tau. Simple computation. Uh, that means you just turn the S1. So this is just exactly this example, except nothing happens on the R2n. Okay? Rate flow again is a loop. Um, and I didn't use anything about R2n, so you even can go to this example I mentioned here. Where is it? W cross S1 for any level domain. Same thing. Yeah, because the, the rate flow will always just de be detected by this. Since you, you take a primitive of the symplectic form, that means d alpha on the symplectic part is non-degenerate already, so it doesn't have a kernel. So the kernel is always in the S1 direction. So all these examples work. Uh, another example, a very concrete one, is this one. Alpha, say, round. Take the standard contact form on the contact sphere. The, what is the rate flow? It's the Hopf circles. Rate flow is periodic. Okay. So all the first examples you're looking at, they are carry plenty of these these orbs. So now discussion is this: is this contractible or not? Because this 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 totally trivial argument, it goes around the S1, so it cannot be contractible. It doesn't doesn't work so well on the sphere. Uh, so it's not contractible. Um, I, I'll comment on that in a second. I just want to say there's a common generalization, if, if you want to, so more generally. Prequantization spaces. So these are bundles, S1 bundles, over the symplectic, over asymplectic manifold such that this first churn class of this, oops, of this bundle is given by a multiple of the symplectic form, where I assume that this guy has a lift to H2MZ. Right, then this is an integer class. K, K is, of course, an integer. Then you can look at all these as one bundle. They are natural symplectic manifolds. In fact, this is an example. This is the example over CPN. Um, and you can think of those guys as trivial bundles. Um, Again, the rate flow goes around the fiber. It's positive. It's a loop. There you go. And here, the here's fact slash conjecture. Uh, rate flow is never contractible. Okay. So it's proved in many cases. That's the fact part. And it's a conjecture, I think, which is very reasonable in general. And there's a very recent paper by, help me out, uh, Presas, um, Ginsburg, and Casals, right? Um, they, they do this for, they prove it for the sphere, but uh, Igor has a very, very beautiful, uh, simple invariant which covers this in many, many cases. Okay, Igor read Givental's paper very thoroughly and understood something which n which I never managed to do. So um, I think it's still Igor's fact, but <laughs> OK, good. Um, so the, the remaining question is, do we know actually a contractible example? All these examples are either non-contractible or conjecturally non-contractible. And I want to write a statement, which of course is not true, but the only known example, contractible example, is on the spheres. And that is Eliasberg, Kim, Boltorowicz, 06. This is not true because once you have one, you can build others from that. Um, first of all, once you have one, you can perturb it a little bit, and the you know, positive is open. Um, and what you can do is once you have it on a sphere, you get it on all two subcritical, two subcritical Weinstein domains as well. So this, of course, needs n at least two. Former, yeah, there's no on, on S1 it doesn't work. Okay, so we have uh, we have very many positive loops, uh, which we probably think are all non-contractible, which are the rate flows, and very few contractible ones. But I, I'm pretty sure this is just lack of understanding. Uh, but well, okay, you can push this prequantization business a little bit further. You can think about prequantization spaces over over symplectic orbifolds. Um, and then, like 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 Brieskorn 
uh, manifolds and stuff like this, they also have periodic grep flows. Um, okay. Good. So now, now I want to give you give you the statement of of the main theorem. For this, I need a little bit of notation. Uh, so we 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 will now assume we have a positive loop of contact homomorphisms. I'm not assuming it's contractible. And then I want to associate to it, to it some quantities. First of all, um, H alpha is the contact Hamiltonian with respect to alpha. Yeah, so the only new thing here is that, that I, I remember the alpha in the notation now, because then the statement will be true for all alphas. Um, that's why I want to remember the alpha. Then this guy has various norms, or semi-norms, that are associated to it namely h alpha plus this is just you take the max of h t x over x and then integrate over dt and then we also define the minus part it's minus the min oops h t of x dt and then we have the oscillation which is just plus plus minus norm or everything with an alpha i guess So we just these, these norms, and they will just show up in, in a second. Um, OK. Um, that's that. Oh, yeah, then the last thing I need to say is uh, if I take a free homotopy class in sigma, then I can look at the following quantity, p alpha nu. And that's backslash weierstrass p for Leitech. Um, this is the minimal period. of a rep orbit in class nu. So this is a number, this is a number which is never zero because the rep vector field doesn't have zeros. And my, my contact manifold is compact. And uh, it, but it might be infinite. And infinite is it, it's just if it's if it's empty. Yeah, sometimes you don't have a rep orbit in that class, then we define to be infinite. Okay, so last bit of thing is nu zero is the class of a point. So it's a trivial trivial class and nu phi is the class given by this loop phi. So it's the class t goes to phi t of your favorite point. Okay. All right, sorry for all this notation, but now we're in the position to write down a theorem. Okay, I'm going to give you a, a special version of a theorem because then it's just prettier. There is a, there's a version for any contact manifolds, but assume a oh, theorem. Yeah. No, it's even better, uh, even worse. Uh, oscillation zero is equivalent to the fact that h t of x is c of t. It's a constant depending on t. Uh, so it's a function only depending on t. But this is the same thing as saying I'm just looking at the, the corresponding contact flow. Contact isotopy is the rib flow, I except reparametrized. OK? Thanks. Good. Theorem. Um, so assume that sigma is Liouville fillable. Basically, all examples I gave are Liouville fillable uh, or hypertight. Hypertight means um, there exists one contact form which ha doesn't have any contractible rep orbits. Okay. All right. So then the statement is: if the oscillation norm, semi-norm of h is less than the minimal period of a contractible rep orbit, uh, this is exactly this quantity, minimal period of a contractible rep orbit, then the plus part of this positive loop, plus norm, plus semi-norm, is at least the minimal period in this class nu phi.
Uh, in fact, if under this assumption there exists a Reb orbit closed, of course, closed Reb orbit with period eta such that um, minus h minus is lesser equal than eta is lesser equal than h plus. That is actually the full statement, and this is the immediate consequence. OK. So let's read the statement once more, and then I'll give you a couple of corollaries. So if the oscillation is not too big of your contact Hamiltonian, and not too big is measured, so remember, there's an alpha on both sides, right? It's, it's measured uh, with respect to alpha, so oscillation um, is sort of depends on alpha because of the contact Hamiltonian depends on alpha. And th the measurement on the right-hand side is the minimal period of a contractible Reb orbit. And then the plus part is, is, is actually big in the sense it's bigger than, than uh, the minimal Reb period in this class given by the loop. OK, that, that is the, the statement. So first corollary. Let me see how I want to phrase this. First corollary is, ah, before we do a first corollary, one little thing, sanity check. So let's take H alpha 1, Quant the rib flow. It better holds for the rib flow. Oscillation norm, as Igor pointed out, is 0. So conclusion is 1, that's the plus part, is greater or equal than p of alpha nu phi. OK, so now let's see why this is correct. First of all, to apply this, I have to assume the rib flow is a loop. Right? This only applies under the assumption that we always have a positive loop now. And the loops are, loops are always parameterized over 0, 1. That means the minimal rib period is precisely 1. Uh, might be, yeah. Right. So it, it, it holds for the, for the rib flow. OK, that's the sanity check. Um, OK, so first corollary. We get norm h alpha plus is greater or equal than the minimum of these two quantities. Uh, so this is a doesn't okay. Let me write a proof. It's totally trivial. Uh, if the oscillation norm is less than this, then apply theorem. Then the theorem immediately tells you h plus is greater or equal than the right quantity here. If not, is greater equal p of alpha nu 0, then just notice, since the loop is positive, the plus part is greater than the oscillation. Because this is negative. I have to check the definition. But then this is negative, so this is, is then greater than p of alpha nu 0. Well, it's just it's just case two cases, so corollary is uh, is this answer to in, in under these assumptions is an answer to this question by Ilyas Berg Polterovich. Are there C zero small positive loops? So no C zero small positive loops. under the assumptions of the theorem. As I said, there's a general statement which is not as pretty. Um, OK. C0 C small means exactly that. The contact Hamiltonian, the plus part is bounded away from 0. That, that's, that's a definition, if you want. That was a question asked. And here there were some previous results by um, 
well, one previous result, Casals, uh, Pressas, and Sandon prove this. There exists a C of alpha positive, um, oh, so yeah, such that H plus alpha is greater or equal than C of alpha for over twisted contact three manifolds. That's, that's what they prove. And C of alpha is, a, is not so easy to compute. It relies on some ed embedding properties, so it's fairly not very explicit. And then Margarita Sandon uh, announced in, in, in various talks that she, she can prove that statement uh, for contractible positive loops on any contact manifolds using her Fleur theory. Um, Yes, in the in the in the paper they write exact they prove exactly the statement and they have re re various remarks of how you can how you can generalize this. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, probably it generalizes. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, that's the first corollary. So you don't get C zero small loops. Uh, another corollary is the famous theorem by Rabinovitz. Rabinovitz, nineteen seventy nine. So if sigma in R two n is star-shaped or bounds, let, let me, bounds a star-shaped hypersurface, in between two, in between two balls, in between a small ball and a big ball, so what I mean by this is, yeah, let me just draw a picture. So here is your star-shaped hypersurface, and there's a small ball, and there's a big ball. Then the statement is, then there exists a closed rep orbit on sigma with period in little pi r squared capital uh, pi capital r squared. And this is, again, a direct corollary of the theorem. Uh, what you do is you look at the rep flow for the round sphere in terms of the contact form of sigma, right? So star shape just gives you a But this rep orbit, but it has a lower bound. There might be actually a very short one. Yeah. I never said that is a simple one. That are the two cases. But that is probably not true. Oh, who knows? Yeah. But that is exactly. But but that's exactly the two cases. If you're small, then you then then you get. So if you know that the the loop, that the rate flow in the new contact form is actually small, then you get it on the nose. That is that statement basically. But if 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 you don't know that, then you on the other hand have to be small. Uh, have to be uh, sorry, wrong way around. If the rate flow is big in the new contact, the round rate flow is in the new contact form big, then you get it on the nose. If it's small, then you can apply the theorem, and then you know something about how small it has to be, and then you can iterate, and you get into this into this into this region. Right, so the only thing you're worried I about is the only thing you need is that there's a periodic orbit that's appeared at most pi r squared. No. Why not? If you have a very small one, you just iterate. Yeah, but maybe, it's but maybe it's not very small, but just so small that it jumps the gap. So okay, you don't need to know. You have one that's smaller than pi capital R squared minus little r squared. Then you're in business. Yeah, but exactly that. Okay. All right. So now, uh, now this uh, systolic inequality uh, I mentioned in the title. So now, what you should do, of course, is you should. Uh, well, it's actually easier to do this with the corollary, with this one. What you should do is you should play the inf sub game, right? So um, you're looking already at, at minimal periods, and now you should look at the soup of all alphas. Mm -hmm. So why is it potentially interesting? Because already in the theorem, uh, if you change the contact form, it's fairly easy to at least estimate what happens to the contact Hamiltonian. That means these quantities h alpha are, are sort of controlled, whereas the periods, no idea. Okay. So uh, let me get this right. 
So we fix phi a positive loop. That's the ingredient. Um, and alpha 0. And then we get h0, which I just defined at h alpha 0. So we get the contact Hamiltonian for that fixed one. OK? So now, how do all other contact forms look like with the same co-orientation? They are just functional multiples. Take a positive function. So then you know that h f times alpha 0, this is, and this is slightly ugly here, this is f composed phi t inverse h t 0. OK, that's what it is. So the new contact Hamiltonian looks is basically f times the old one, except you have to reparameterize here a little bit. So that means that is very controlled, but the, uh, the right hand side is, is totally unclear. So then the statement is the minimum of p of f alpha nu 0, p of f alpha nu phi is less or equal. And then you do the stupid estimate here, and you just say h0 plus times L infinity norm of f. OK? So in particular, you get the soup over all f with L infinity norm less or equal than 1 of the right hand side. is less or equal than a fixed quantity. OK, so this is, this is, so this is what, what, what I want to call a contact systolic, in L-infinity contact systolic inequality. So uh, let's compare this to what, what really are systolic inequalities from Riemannian geometry. Yeah, so you, there you, you fix a Riemannian manifold, well, a manifold, and look at all Riemannian metrics. And you look at, for each individual Riemannian metric, you look for the shortest closed geodesic, sometimes with additional properties. And then like, look for the, the soup over all these metrics. And of course, you need to normalize to, to kick out rescalings of the metric. No? But if you do this, this is exactly the same setup in the contact geometry. And this was proposed, actually, by uh, Alvarez, Paiva, and Balachev. And they proved quite some interesting stuff in 2014. So this was proposed by Alvarez, Paiva, and Balachev. Um, the paper is from 2014, so they're, but they're, they're thinking about this quite a bit longer. And what they proposed is something else. They proposed to look at the supremum over um, not the L infinity norm, but the Ln norm. And I'm going to say in a, in a second why this is the right thing, of, of similar quantities. So now I'm sort of freely interpreting the works, but, but some, some quantity about, about the minimal period. Uh, so why, is, why, why did that they want to look at this? Because if you fix the volume of f alpha to be 1, that's, that's the fix you get from Riemannian geometry. You, you fix the, the volume of the, of the Riemannian metric. Then what is that? Well, this is you integrate f alpha wedge f uh, d f alpha to the n minus 1 or something. Right? This is f n alpha wedge d alpha to the n minus 1. So this, <coughs> this is the f n norm, uh, the ln norm to the n. That's what they want to fix. Uh, unfortunately, this is not bounded in general. This supreme in general is infinity. This is very recent work by Alberto Abondandolo. Let me not write all the names. They're terrible long. Abondandolo, Bramham, Hinevich. Also, I don't know how to spell him if I don't look it up. <laughs> and Sa Salomao. So Abondandolo, Bramham, Hinevich, Salomao. They proved on S3 the, uh, this one is infinite. Which was a conjecture by Hutching that it's finite. 
Oh, that I don't know. Um, of course, then n is 2, right? That's the L2 norm. That's the, the usual thing you use. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not. In, in, in fact, they proved even more. Uh, uh, sort of these guys proved that if you go away from the round contact form up to infinite order, nothing changes. Sort of infinitesimal, nothing changes up to any order. Um, they proved it uh, for on a three. This is just short to hell. Um, but if you go from the round contact structure, round contact form. In fact, all these there are many round ones. Okay, if you go away, f uh, stay, stay. C three close, fairly close to the round one. Then uh, it's actually it actually is bounded. So for this, you have to go fairly far away. But the interesting part of their of their construction is that the uh, these contact flows, the replos, still have global surface of section. But they're very star-shaped. If you look at them in, in C4, they're extremely star-shaped. So in particular, the, 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 the L infinity norm goes, goes immediately through the roof. OK. So the L2 one does hold, and then we proved a version of this for the L infinity norm. OK, so let, let me just spend five minutes on what goes into the proof, and then I'm done. So what goes into the proof um, is a stretching so proof. The main theorem is a stretching stretching argument uh, in or for the Rabinowitz flow action uh, or the Rabinowitz I don't know Rabinowitz action. Um, I, I don't want to want to spell this this all out. I just want to I, I want to just say where we do this. And one really important uh, input is Igor's cutoff technique in one of his papers that made things much sharper than they were in the past. So uh, I just want to say stretching argument because so the important information here is I, I, we don't need to do any. Fleur homology. So there's no Rabinowitz Fleur homology. There's no perturbations going on. This this is all much much simpler. Um, and then what we study is study translated points uh, send and send on. Sorry. So this 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 study of translated points for this positive loop. And I just want to draw one picture to illustrate what's going on. So typically, what is a translated point for such a pass that looks something like this. So this is a loop. Starts at some point, And then this is the flow phi t. Remember, phi was our, our path. And so you end up at phi 1 of x. And then you go back here. You follow with the rib flow uh, with, with a certain speed eta. So what we are really studying are points x such that phi 1 of x equals theta minus eta of x plus additional conditions. There's one condition of the contact form I don't want to write down. Yeah, so this is what we want to study. And the only observation now entering is, lo let's look at this picture if phi is actually a loop. So phi a loop, then how does this picture look like? Well, that means phi 1 is the identity, so this picture really looks like this. <coughs> x is phi 1 of x is theta minus eta of x. And where does what flow? Here it's phi t. And here's theta minus eta t. So it really looks like a figure 8, because these two points are the same. So uh, and now you see a rip orbit. Yeah, I mean, figure 8 doesn't look particularly smooth. Uh, you have to believe me. It's, uh, this is actually a rib orbit. So the lower part is a rib orbit, and you and uh, if you assume that the homotopy class of this entire configuration is trivial, then that loop is in the opposite homotopy class of that loop, and because of this minus sign, they're actually in the same. Uh, so all you have to do, I mean, all you have to do is find one critical point with the corresponding action estimate, and and that's that's what we're doing. Uh, but that's well, if you want to know that, I'm happy to tell you over lunch or something. OK, that's all I wanted to tell for today. Thank you very much.